Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here today. I am going to get things started now because you've all joined us promptly at 11 a.m. So uh, EST or EDT, thank you so much for joining. So um, yes, thank you so much for joining our uh, webinar today. We'll be talking about how to empower therapeutic antibody programs with polyclonal antibody sequencing. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with who I am, uh, my name is Anthony. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Rapnovor. You've got my contact information here. Feel free to screenshot it. Otherwise, uh, feel free to uh, focus in the chat. Of course, we'll be uh, able to make these recordings available uh, after the session as well. And through an email, you'll have a recording link. So you can always grab that contact information there, or you can always reply to the email. And of course, we'll respond to you right away um, at the time. Uh, for today's talk, I think it serves us well to have a quick agenda. What are we going to talk about? Uh, a bit of an introduction to our company, some of our services, some of the stuff that we've been doing uh, lately. Uh, of course, why polyclonal antibodies? And um, you know, considering them as a new fuel for your uh, monoclonal antibody discovery projects and certainly empowering um, any polyclonal-based uh, projects that you may have underway as well. And uh, we're going to round it out by discussing some of the case studies um, and the evidence that we've been able to generate so far in the past um, a uh, couple of years of uh, polyclonal antibody sequencing uh, being live in the market. So uh, Rapid Novor, as you can see, has been founded in 2015. It's the brainchild of our co-founders, uh, Dr. Bin Ma in particular, uh, who has been uh, the chief scientific officer and, and president of the company since its inception. Um, prior to founding Rapid Novor, he had been uh, developing proteomics software. Uh, in, in, in this very similar space, um, but it was about um, seven years ago that he specifically focused on the application of protein sequencing using mass spectrometry. And in that time, we become the largest privately funded proteomics facility in Canada. We now have over 10 mass spectrometers in-house. Uh, we've got well over 50 employees and we've sequenced uh, well over uh, four to 500 different proteins, um, in particular, a lot of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, but uh, monoclonal antibody sequencing is not the only service that we do now. Um, as we're going to talk about today, we of course do polyclonal antibody sequencing using our Repab antibody discovery platform. But certainly we've also been uh, leveraging other aspects of our technology um, towards uh, um, sequence confirmation using MatchMab, uh, HDX epitope mapping, as well as Novarig, which is useful for tracking the immune response. These are a couple of words, but uh, serves us well to also have uh, some diagrams and, and a bit of an introduction into the technology generally. Uh, how it works. So when we do the, the remap workflow for sequencing monoclonal antibodies and proteins, uh, we first start by, by running a gel. We like to see if the gel um, can uh, show us uh, what the sample looks like. As you can see, we sometimes have a nice uh, clear uh, gel with two bands for your heavy and light chain and sometimes not so clear bands <laughs> in case of other proteins being present in those samples. This helps us to assess the samples and see uh, what kinds of, uh, kinds of projects we're uh, setting ourselves up here uh, for. But once we have the sample of interest and we, and we feel confident in moving forward, uh, we do a multi-enzyme digest. And so we use a number of different proteases to cleave these uh, monoclonal antibodies into their constituent peptides. Those peptides, once prepared, will then fly on our mass spectrometer and <clears throat> excuse me. Once they generate sufficient spectra, uh, we're able to interpret those spectra using our algorithms and uh, 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 generate peptide sequences. And these peptide sequences, uh, once we have enough and of, of sufficient coverage, we can then uh, generate a full length contiguous heavy and light chain sequence, uh, which can then be uh, sent off as a final report. Of course, for Repad, things are a bit different. We have some extra tools in the toolbox to, to achieve a, a similar goal of generating monoclonal antibody sequences. Um, <clears throat> so in these projects, uh, we typically start off with your, your serum and, and put it through a very similar workflow to what I just described above um, with respect to doing a multi-enzyme digest, um, flying it on the mass spec, getting peptide reads, and assembling them with the full-length contiguous heavy and light chains. Of course, if we have the uh, uh, material available to us, we also like to do uh, a bulk RNA-seq, um, leveraging the PBMCs typically, but splenocytes are fine if it's an animal. Um, and of course, performing a transcriptomic analysis so that we can generate perspective heavy and light chains uh, from that perspective as well. Once we have all of these um, heavy and light chain sequences assembled, we, uh, we put them into a, a bioinformatics 
uh, database, and then we can actually use um, both sets of data uh, for uh, doing the, the, the full link sequencing. Uh, of course, we also have a, a technology that we've developed in-house for performing chain pairing. Uh, we don't do single cell sequencing. We don't do uh, the chain pairing from a genomics perspective. We completely uh, pair the perspective uh, cognate heavy and light chains using a proteomics based method. Uh, from there, though, we will generate full-length IgGs and uh, either send them off as a final report for expression or express them recombinantly with some of our partners. Match map is a, is a bit of a simpler workflow. Um, in this case, it's similar to the workflows I've described above, but we just do a two enzyme digest and just really try to see if antibody A is the same as antibody B. Sometimes, you know, you've been working with a good antibody for a long time, but you try to buy it two or three years later and you want to see if the uh, antibody B, the, the, this new batch that you've purchased is the same as the, uh, the originator. In some cases it isn't, and of course that's, that's useful. HDX epitope mapping, um, of course, is a service for uh, determining the uh, binding uh, amino acids responsible in a, in a, in a protein protein uh, binding interaction, typically in our case, a monoclonal antibody and an antigen of interest. And in this case, we can determine uh, which uh, amino acids are responsible for that interaction. Lastly, we have NovaRig. Uh, this is a service that really, I think, builds off of the, the polyclonal antibody sequencing uh, workflow, where once we've generated some uh, perspective sequences that are present in a sample of interest, be it from uh, an animal or a patient or something like this, uh, we can then actually identify proteotypic peptides, so unique peptides, um, which uh, uh, allow us to uh, perform a relative quantitation of, of, those, of those peptides. And uh, in this way, we can take a longitudinal sample set and assess the antibody population as it's uh, as its uh, relative abundance changes over time, or not, as the case may be. These services all comprehensively uh, fit into a number of different uh, early stage drug discovery um, uh, uh, aspects. So obviously uh, we've been able to plug ourselves into aspects of the target validation uh, workflows, both through the REMAB and, uh, and, and PAB, a number of other sequencing uh, um, uh, applications. Uh, we've worked with lead isolation and identifying those good monoclonal antibodies against your target of interest. Um, we've been able to insert ourselves into lead profiling by offering uh, more insight into what kinds of specific antibodies uh, are interacting with what kinds of antigens and, and how. And of course, even in, in preclinical and clinical development, we found some applications there as well, particularly in the PKPD side of things and generating good monoclonal antibodies against your target to, to fully characterize you know, your therapeutic of interest. So that brings us to our next uh, and, and most, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, desired topic, which is the lead isolation and, and what, why are we working with polyclonal antibodies? So of course today, you know, we're talking about therapeutic paths. Uh, there are actually a number of polyclonal antibodies on the market today. Um, I've, I've listed a few here. We've got Digifab, which is an antidote for uh, the uh, overconsumption of digoxin. Um, this is actually an ovine, so it comes from sheep. Uh, thymoglobulin, which is a, actually a commonly used polyclonal antibody in transplants uh, uh, to avoid transplant rejection and, and uh, in skin grafts to avoid host versus uh, graft disease. This is a rabbit polyclonal antibody. Travelin, this is a newer one. Um, this actually comes to us from a company in Australia, and they use this to, uh, uh, to treat traveler's diarrhea. And the last one is Protectin, which is uh, come to the same company, Imuron. Um, and again, they generate this bovine polyclonal antibody to help digest uh, help, help, uh, uh, digestive function. These are clinically approved um, polyclonal antibodies in all cases, the last one being uh, only approved in Australia, but the rest of these being approved uh, pretty much worldwide. So I find this interesting because indeed polyclonal antibodies are not just research reagents. They are in fact therapeutic agents um, active in the market today and addressing uh, meaningful clinical issues. So, that brings us to the next question of why consider uh, these PABs in, in the way that we're suggesting it, right? Because I don't think that uh, you've come to this talk to, <laughs> to hear me talk about uh, therapeutic polyclonal antibodies in the sense that I just showed you. I think you're here to talk to learn a little bit about how you can maybe leverage your existing polyclonal antibodies um, towards a monoclonal antibody discovery uh, program or approach. So of course, uh, it, it's fair to compare a PAB and a MAB um, and how, how we get each one. So with a monoclonal antibody, of course, there's a lot of one individual uh, monoclonal antibody protein in that sample of interest. Uh, it has an antigen that it recognizes typically against one epitope of that antigen. And in this way, we can faithfully um, characterize that monoclonal antibody and antigen interaction. Uh, generating a monoclonal antibody is, of course, uh, one of the more challenging aspects of any 
uh, antibody discovery workflow, you know, um, whether you're working with hybrid domas, whether you're doing a phage or other display um, approach, or doing a single sequencing approach, generating good monoclonal antibodies is a non-trivial uh, task. And certainly, um, you know, in terms of sequestering individual B cells, finding antigen positive ones, culturing them, recovering them, sequencing them, generating recombinants, this is all um, a lot of work in order to actually demonstrate uh, a, a functionally relevant and, uh, and meaningfully efficacious antibody that you can access on, on an ongoing uh, for an ongoing period. And so these are some of the challenges that are, that are particular to the, to the monoclonal antibody um, um, generation platform. But of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of advantages if you go through all of that, right? You can uh, and, uh, obtain a, a, a sequence of this monoclonal antibody of interest or even a hyperdoma. Um, and in that way, you can indefinitely generate that monoclonal antibody of interest. And of course, it's, it's you know, uh, a well-established protocol, standardized approach. Um, people can generate monoclonal antibodies in, in massive quantities. Um, that's no surprise. Um, but as we compare that to a polyclonal, uh, what, what are some of the differences? Well, with a polyclonal, of course, you, you have poly, uh, there's uh, multiple different monoclonal antibodies present. You have a, a multitude of MABs uh, within that polyclonal mixture which can uh, effectively target your antigen of interest from a, from a number of different perspectives, a number of different epitopes. This engenders um, a sense of robustness, and this also um, uh, allows for a, a very uh, a broad biophysical diversity so that it works in not only one application like a Western block, for example, but in others such as uh, immunohistochemistry, um, uh, or maybe a flow cytometry approach, um, you know, because you have just so many different antibodies targeting this uh, antigen of interest from so many different angles, you just have a, a higher probability of it working in a, in a cross-functional context. And also that um, these antibodies won't necessarily degrade um, as a result of shipment, as a result of um, uh, sample preparation, or what the case may be. So you have this greater sense of robustness um, and efficacy uh, that is this cross-platform. But of course, um, some of the advantages uh, come with come with uh, associated disadvantages, right? Um, you have a lot of batch to batch variability with generating a PAB. Um, it can be very difficult to characterize them, uh, particularly in this uh, um, antibody antigen interaction. Um, it can be very challenging to understand, you know, uh, which of these antibodies are targeting the antigen um, at all times and where and under which circumstances. You know, these these uh, more uh, 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 Point it, uh, points of characterization can be more difficult to determine um, with a polyclonal antibody. But I think one of the over one of the, the, the most important variables uh, with the PAB is that from the onset, from the immunization and purification step onward, you know that once you've tested it, it, it works. Um, and, and it's actually quite a bit, uh, we would argue, quite a bit easier to generate a PAB against a target of interest than a MAP against a target of interest. And that's kind of the point of, of what we're saying here, right? Is that um, by just going through that immunization process, which is true in both cases, the MAP, the MAP or the PAB, but then just from taking that um, immunization and then uh, checking to see what kinds of antibodies you're binding against your target, you can immediately um, uh, uh, understand that you have a functionally active polyclonal antibody against your target of interest. So with that in mind, how does it serve us? Well, we feel that it allows us to take advantage of a number of different platforms, um, particularly a number of different animal biologies. Um, you know, we've successfully ran the REPAB platform against uh, a number of rabbit projects, um, in, in some cases canines. Uh, we've recently done a goat project, which we'll be showing a little bit later on uh, today as well. And we have ongoing projects in mice and in humans and in camelids, uh, particularly um, alpacas. And so, you know, the ability to target a number of different animal biologies, which may be more relevant depending on your context. Um, I know that monoclonal antibodies are typically found in mice, but um, mice aren't always the, the answer, right? Sometimes it can be challenging to get a good map uh, against some target of interest if it's made in mice. And so being able to take advantage of different biologies, different um, antibody generation strategies may be of interest, if only to differentiate yourself from what you know already doesn't work. Uh, beyond the fact that we can start off with immunizations, um, there are just a number of existing catalogs uh, and a number of existing anti polyclonal antibodies that are in people's freezers, you know, like you, you may already have a good functionally validated polyclonal antibody in, in great quantity um, that's sitting in your freezer or that's available to you um, in, 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 a, in a library of sorts that you have access to. So um, from, from this premise, you know, we see that there's a, a new fuel that could be used towards the antibody discovery uh, goals that your team may have. So uh, that's the idea, that's the premise. Um, how does it actually work? So for us, when we do these projects, uh, we can start at a number of different stages. Um, 
we can start from scratch. We can start off with an immunization against a target of interest and an animal uh, of interest. Uh, conventionally, we run these programs in rabbits. Uh, we have a lot of experience in rabbits. Uh, and we have, we have that pipeline figured out. Um, however, I would say that our, our species agnostic, our, our platform is relatively species agnostic. So all these, all these other species that you've seen as well, um, you know, are, are fair game for us um, to interrogate. But we start off with the immunization. Uh, we do uh, usually a multi round uh, of boosters, and then we will uh, extract the serum and we will extract some PBMCs. Uh, the PBMCs will serve us well in doing B, uh, bulk RNA-seq um, so that we can capture the, the breadth of the immune repertoire uh, within, the, within those B cells. And then the serum will serve us well once we've done a couple of purifications. So we typically do a protein A purification followed by an antigen specific affinity purification. And in this way, we uh, obtain a fraction which is relatively homogeneous and uh, antigen specific against the target of interest. Uh, from there, we typically would run some kind of a functional assay like an ELISA. Um, or your assay of choice to, to ensure that, you know, ultimately the, the way that this PAB is going to be used is congruent with what we're going to be trying to sequence. Once we have the uh, samples ready and we actually have something that we can work with, uh, we can then start the screening. And so um, should you already have a polyclonal antibody that you know works in your context and you've already gone through this process, we could always start the project at the screen as well. You don't have to start um, strictly at the immunization phase. Um, but once we have these PABs ready to go, we screen them. Um, and for us, uh, we take up to five different samples against a common target and, uh, and see how it looks in the mass spec. So that means we're running a, a couple of enzyme digests um, and, and seeing what kind of data that we get. So your, your sample set could be like five uh, uh, patients in a cohort, five rabbits in a cohort, or maybe a couple of different uh, rabbits or, or patients, uh, but purified in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, we've seen people try this by uh, having a protein target of interest and then generating uh, purification reagents, which are a subdomain of that protein uh, fused onto um, perhaps an FC domain. Uh, uh, and so we have an FC fusion construct, which is a better purification reagent in terms of generating epitope specific binding antibodies. Um, and that, this is one strategy that you could employ. Otherwise, you know, we've cer certainly worked with um, um, anti-peptide and anti-protein uh, products in the past as well. So once we've um, screened these uh, prospective samples, we'll pick one that looks best under our, uh, under our workflow, and then we perform the deep sequencing step. Now, this could be uh, proteogenomics, or this could be uh, proteomics only uh, based approach, but um, uh, nonetheless, we are going to be doing more of the de novo protein sequencing workflow, where we do uh, more uh, enzyme digests, and we generate a, a number of uh, overlapping peptides across the antibody of interest. Uh, and if we can, we will perform, like I said, the uh, transcriptomic analysis of the circulating B cells uh, from the PBMC fraction. From there, we generate a library of prospective monoclonal antibody sequences. And then once we have that library prepared, we can either send that off as a deliverable or uh, recombinantly express these antibodies um, in, in uh, your format of choice. That could be um, just the, uh, the exact same antibodies that we've already worked with, or we could engineer those antibodies to be isotype um, um, switched or uh, perhaps humanized or chimeric or whatever the case may be. So of course, what are some of the results? Well, uh, as I said earlier, we like working with rabbits. Um, and truthfully, we like working with rabbits because uh, they provide us with enough material um, to work with. Uh, we typically ask for one milligram of purified polyclonal antibody that is antigen specific. And um, we also have the ability to work with the, the B cells of the rabbits in, in, in a, in a well-validated and, and robust fashion. Of course, um, doing B cell repertoire sequencing of uh, rabbit uh, B cells is, 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 a, is a relatively accessible uh, um, uh, technology for us. And, and by that, I mean, there are commercially available kits that we can deploy against that, uh, against that project. And, so, and of course, uh, beyond those functional uh, reasons for choosing rabbits, we found some um, uh, uh, significant advantages to working with rabbit and antibodies. In particular, they have excellent kit, uh, 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 binding affinity, particularly in immunohistochemistry. Uh, rabbits also have a uh, unique ability to target small, um, well, targets. Uh, they have uh, the advantage of, of working well against uh, sub-20 peptides. And so for um, those reasons, you know, we find uh, good efficacy in some of the targets that we uh, tackle with rabbit antibodies, in particular peptide targets.
Uh, further, they have a unique ontogeny, and so you're going to get something different out of the rabbit antibody repertoire than you are out of a rodent antibody repertoire. And lastly, they have this additional disulfide bond um, in, in between their light chain uh, um, variable domains. And so we find that they are very stable and robust uh, monoclonal antibodies as well. Um, and so naturally, uh, from this premise, we've identified a number of different applications um, in which the, the polyclonal antibody sequencing technology could be applied. Um, therapeutic antibody development, characterization of an immune response, um, diagnostic projects, and certainly the lowest hanging fruit for us was just uh, converting a PAB to a MAB or a MAB cocktail. And so we did that. Uh, we immunized our rabbit with a peptide of interest, and we generated some sequences. Um, so for those of you who have never seen uh, proteomics sequencing coverage before, um, this is it. Um, so the very top bar denotes the region of interest. So your framework region is in green and your orange uh, bars here denote the CDRs. And of course I've highlighted CDRH3. Uh, why? Because we have good coverage all the way through. Um, so this is your, your region that we're interrogating. Below that is the uh, amino acid sequence, which we've obfuscated in this case. And then below that, you see the different colored bars. Those are observed peptides that we pulled from the mass spec and interpreted using our algorithms. And the different colors denote different sample preparation chemistries. So different enzymes that we used in order to generate these uh, prospective sequences. As you can see, they cleave at different amino acids. And so naturally they overlap uh, across these different amino acids and give us an overlapping uh, uh, coverage map that goes across the entire heavy and light chain. Um, for us, a good surrogate of accuracy before we express and test these antibodies is the level of coverage that we're obtaining. So um, generally we wouldn't try to report a monoclonal antibody sequence unless it had at least 20 to 30 overlapping peptides over every single amino acid. And in this case, we certainly met that threshold uh, even throughout uh, these more uh, uh, difficult areas, um, like in particular the light chain. So we found that very strong evidence for that, uh, that particular antibody sequence. And indeed we found another one uh, from the same sample set. And so we expressed them and tested them with an ELISA. And we found that these, uh, 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 these monoclonal antibodies, R1 and R3, uh, faithfully recapitulated the binding activity of the original polyclonal, which you see here in blue, um, which is PD030. Further, we uh, characterized these antibodies using uh, SPR analysis, and we found that uh, the two monoclonals that we uh, had uh, expressed and tested uh, performed really quite well as compared to the original polyclonal. They were all low single digit nanomolar binders and naturally we were quite happy with these. Uh, we do use them internally as reagents on an ongoing basis. So from there, uh, we did uh, continue the development this time in a diagnostic context. So we had uh, a client come to us and say, hey, can you generate a good monoclonal antibody uh, against the peptide of interest that we're um, going to be trying to pull from uh, blood samples in, 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 in the clinic? And we said, sure. And so we uh, generated these uh, prospective monoclonal antibodies that would bind this peptide and allow them to perform a relative quantitative uh, assay uh, in that clinical context. In a crunch time, uh, they left us with only proteomics uh, because at this time we had not yet onboarded our NGS uh, lab. And so we only had the proteomics to work with. But nonetheless, the, the client found that these antibodies were highly specific, high affinity, and indeed fit for purpose in their application of interest. So uh, as you can see here, these are six monoclonal antibody sequences that we found in the sample, which were generated using only proteomics. Uh, when we reported this initially last uh, winter, we actually were the, we, and we still are, the first and only team to actually be able to sequence a polyclonal antibody using only proteomics. Um, a number of teams have also tried this using proteogenomics, but indeed um, using only proteomics, we are the first um, and still the only team who can perform this kind of analysis. But as you can see, um, all six perform really well compared to the red line, which is your original polyclonal antibody. And all six were also paired um, with the cognitive heavy and light chains, again, using only our proteomics-based technology. Eventually, though, we did get our hands on some NGS data. And uh, with that NGS data, we were able to pull out an additional six monoclonal antibodies against that target of interest, all of which faithfully recapitulated the binding of this uh, original PAB seen in this, uh, in this red line here. The last example I have to share with you guys is this uh, GOAT project that we've worked on uh, with our, our, our partners at Absolute Antibody and Everest Biotech. So this was a GOAT sample that had been immunized with a peptide. And uh, an interesting uh, note about this project is that we observed only two major forms uh, in the polyclonal antibody mixture 
uh, amongst the polyclonal background. So indeed, it is an interesting observation that uh, this case, there was really only two dominant monoclonal antibodies doing the heavy lifting in terms of the binding, uh, in terms of their applications. So when we first got this data, we were quite excited to see excellent levels of coverage um, because this data came from, I, I think, uh, well, it was a little bit late in the summer, so July or August, um, you know, we were quite happy to see that our levels of coverage have been significantly improving since um, a year and a half ago. And um, naturally, we expected to have good results from these projects, and indeed we did. Um, our friends at Absolute Antibody found that these two monoclonals, seen here in black and pink, faithfully recapitulated the binding of this uh, green-blue tab, uh, both by a indirect ELISA and by a uh, competition ELISA. So here we're able to faithfully demonstrate that um, in a number of different applications, uh, the technology has been used to um, isolate, sequence, express, and validate uh, monoclonal antibodies that were actually originally from a polyclonal antibody mixture, in essence, uh, recapitulating its binding activity and uh, cross-platform performance. And so as uh, we continue to uh, uh, develop our technologies, we're, we're keen to take on additional projects. Um, I think that there's some interesting observations that we've been able to pull from these kinds of projects, in particular, um, the discordance between some of the genomic sequencing and the protein sequencing that we've done. So by that, I mean, um, in some of these projects, we actually observe um, only as, as few as one mRNA transcript encoding for a particular um, antibody uh, variable region, but we see it to be a, we see it as a top five clone in the proteomics data, and uh, exactly why that uh, result uh, appears is uh, up for interpretation. There's a number of different reasons why I think we, we're observing that. It could be that the uh, the primers are biased. It could be the samples are biased. It could be the purification protocols. It could be a number of things, right? But um, I find it interesting nonetheless, and and certainly adds um, I think to the argument that performing a proteomics based approach. Uh, for the sequencing work can, it can engender um, a new result and, and, and certainly uh, uh, improve the results that you're getting out of a given monoclonal antibody uh, discovery platform. So with that in mind, uh, we are happy to take some questions uh, about the platform. So feel free to jump into the chat. I'll be able to answer your questions there. Um, Eric, will your slides be posted on your website? Uh, I don't know that they'll be posted on the website. I do know that we'll be able to send them to you directly. Um, so Eric, I've, I've got you noted here and uh, yeah, we'll be able to send you the slides uh, in, in a follow-up email. Okay. Okay, there's a number of questions here. Um, Bernard, I'm mindful of your hand. Please feel free to uh, type in the chat and I'll be able to answer you there. Uh, Lee, I see your question here. Nice to see you. Uh, what software do we use to perform the de novo sequencing? We have our own software that we use to do this sequencing work. Dr. Bin Ma um, had previously written the, the popular proteomic software suite called Peaks. Uh, we actually don't use Peaks. Uh, bin, uh, Dr. Ma uh, rewrote the uh, the software that we use called Novor and Remab uh, um, from the ground up over the past several years. Michael Barr, I see you uh, asking, how long does a typical project take? Um, from the moment that we receive the purified IgGs um, and PBMCs or other genetic materials, should we be able to use it? Um, a project typically takes two to three months for us to generate the prospective library of sequences. Um, of course, if we, if we have to do expression thereafter, it can take another well, couple of months usually to do the expression work. And if we have to do the purification upfront, um, that typically takes us about a few weeks. So it just depends on where we're getting started. Um, and if we have to do the immunizations, of course, that's like a few months as well. Um, but just the sequencing portion itself, about two to three months, yeah. I'm seeing uh, Rob DeYoung. Are the constant domain sequences you send back based solely on your proteomics data or also corrected by BLAST data, thinking about the isoleucine and leucine assignment? Uh, they are, I guess, truly really based on the proteomics data. I mean, fundamentally, what we're doing is de novo antibody or de novo, de novo protein sequencing. And so we're always trying to find 
um, peptides which have flanking ions on either side of each individual amino acid call. And so truly it's a ground up proteomics um, de novo sequencing approach. And so certainly uh, we use BLAST data and other um, online databases to support the efforts of our sequencing, but um, ultimately we're always um, trying to capture the uh, observed sequences that are in the sample of interest. Um, particularly with isoleucine and leucine, uh, we actually do have a protocol that we've developed um, for uh, determining isoleucine and leucine. Um, it is very well established and very robust for monoclonal antibodies. The polyclonal antibody um, sequencing projects uh, still serves us really well. And so um, it's based off of an ETHCD protocol where we're able to obtain ions, W ions, which can uh, differentiate between isoleucine and leucine. Um, and so we do leverage that experiment and those and, and that um, that protocol um, in the in the polyclonal antibody sequencing as well. And so this allows us typically to differentiate between isoleucine and leucine. Um, I'll also add that um, in any given case, we're always going to be um, offering to you uh, the data that we obtained in order to in order to come to that conclusion. So um, you know, we can always um, show you what we've um, been able to determine and how, how confident we are in any given isoleucine and leucine assignment. Um, but yeah, Rob, if you uh, have more questions about that, please feel free to email me and uh, we can always uh, discuss that uh, at length as well. Uh, I'm going to jump over to Phil. Uh, Phil Hemkin, uh, how do you know which antibodies in the PAB from the rabbits have the best performance? Uh, truly, the, the best way to know that is to actually express and test individual monoclonal antibodies. You know, um, uh, what you'll get out of our platform is the most abundant monoclonal antibodies uh, in the polyclonal antibody uh, uh, serum. And so whether um, if you'd like to have, for example, like the really rare clones that you might believe to be um, really high affinity binders, um, it's honestly unlikely that the, the mass spec-based sequencing approach will capture extremely rare clones. Um, but of course, we can have a discussion about what is a rare clone. Um, as I said earlier, um, you know, you could see as few as one mRNA transcript encoding for a particular antibody of interest, but it's a top five clone in the proteomics. So what is a, a, a rare clone is also, um, I guess, you know, a, a fair question to ask. Um, and, and really, you know, uh, we, we try to purify the polyclonal antibodies for um, very high affinity monoclonal antibodies within the mixture. Um, the purification strategies that we deploy um, can be quite harsh. And so naturally, uh, we try to ensure that the antibody antigen uh, binding interaction just in, the, in terms of the purification um, is only going to yield like really high affinity binders. So we try to bias uh, the purification in that way. And subsequently, the, the, the mass based approach will only pull out those antibodies. So hopefully we, we find um, only really good binders. And typically, that's been the case. Um, the maps that we've expressed and tested have all really performed quite well um, against our targets of interest. Uh, Wendy Sandoval asking, uh, how do you map peptides to the appropriate PAB? Uh, I suppose this is a question about the assembly, and this is quite an involved question. <laughs> um, I, 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 I uh, would say that, you know, we have a number of different uh, techniques that we uh, deploy in order to fractionate the given PAB uh, into, into sub uh, sub PABs is probably a better way to put it. Um, you know, we use HPLC, HIC. Um, uh, 2D gels, like we do a number of different uh, uh, techniques in order to try to fractionate that polyclonal antibody response into, into more um, homogenous uh, uh, polyclonal antibody responses. And in this way, we can work with a, a lot of different fractions and couple them to our sequencing uh, workflow in order to generate um, more homogenous uh, uh, um, antibody profiles. And um, I think the fundamentally when it comes to taking those peptides and assembling them into a full length uh, antibody uh, heavier light chain, you know, it just comes with experience. We just have, we've actually sequenced like um, close to 5,000 monoclonal antibodies and proteins, and we've now done the polyclonal workflow um, a few dozen times. And so um, that just comes with experience. I'm happy to talk to you um, further about that, Wendy, please um, feel free to reach out. Phil asking again, how are the rapid PABs narrowed to the best PABs? Um, I, I think I kind of answered that already with um, my last point about the purification, um, you know, it's it's always a matter of you know, like like a lot of other things. I'm garbage in, garbage out. So we really try to make sure that um, the antibodies we take in are not garbage. <laughs> they are very functionally relevant in their context of interest by um, running uh, um, assays um, with the PAB that are um, you know what you expect to get out of the MAB at the end of the day. So whether they're ELISA or um, 
um, IHC um, um, focused antibodies or whatever the case may be. Um, we really try to functionally validate the PABs up front and then um, you know, really try to find the subset of the PAB um, that is most active and, um, and highest affinity uh, through the purification protocols that we deploy. Uh, Shout John Ma asking, how do you match the heavy and light chains? Uh, yeah, so we do have a proteomics approach for this. Um, at this time, we are uh, unable to talk too much about it. We are, um, um, I guess, solidifying the IP on that front. And so um, we'll be able to talk about that further um, in the future. But essentially, we, we deploy a number of different uh, conventionally used approaches, conventionally um, used experiments. Um, we pair them with our, our uh, de novo sequencing capabilities. Um, so. In, in, in one iteration, for example, we can not only use bottom-up mass spec in order to generate uh, peptide sequences, but we can do things like top-down uh, approaches where we start off with the intact molecule, the intact functional antibody uh, of interest. And then we can do something like an intact mass, for example, um, and, and identify the prospective uh, protein species that are, are useful against, uh, uh, that, that are, um, uh, matching correctly with the prospective sequences that we've generated. And so that's, that's one iteration, one kind of experiment that we can do uh, to kind of whittle down um, the, the potential um, heavy and light chain pairings. But we have a number of experiments that we run that kind of serve a similar goal uh, and function. And again, uh, happy to talk to you um, further about that uh, uh, offline, Xiao John. Polly, Michael saying poly to recombinant expression. Uh, okay, so from polyclonal antibody to recombinant expression, yeah. Um, if you sent us a polyclonal antibody and it was purified and we just did the sequencing and then the expression work, that would probably take us uh, four to five months, yeah. Bernard asking, from how many animal species are you able to do sequences by mass spec? Uh, feel free to send as many as you would like, Bernard. Um, <laughs> we've certainly worked with, um, as I said earlier, we've worked with rabbit, we've worked with uh, canines, we've worked with goats successfully, uh, and we have ongoing projects in mice, in humans, in camelids, uh, potentially sheep as well. Um, fundamentally, because we're, we're you know, working with um, peptides when we do our sequencing approach, we're, we're somewhat species agnostic. Um, it helps for us to have uh, protocols to do an NGS workflow uh, as well. So if you for example, done like a phage display library in, in um, some um, other species, like let's say sheep, for example, um, and you have a, a, a fully prepared library um, that you're about to do the, the, the phage display on, uh, we could potentially take that and just run an NGS um, in order to generate uh, the, the, the circulating B cell repertoire, and that will help us do the protein sequencing. But fundamentally, we're pretty open to a lot of different species. Um, it just depends on your particular context and what the antigen is, right? Um, uh, you know. You don't want to uh, throw us a really complicated project on a species we've never worked on. Um, it's best to, to start off small and, and work our way up. But um, yeah, we're fundamentally agnostic, so we're happy to talk to you further about other species you have interest. Uh, Miriam Abdulatif asking, uh, how many projects do you handle at one time? Uh, great question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I would say that at this time, uh, you know, we can handle something like five to ten uh, projects within a, within a few months, um, and I think that uh, in the past year we we did a couple dozen. So um, I think that we're hopefully uh, looking to expand on that as well. So just please come to me with uh, your your project of interest, and I can tell you, you know, if we have any lead time. But at this time, we're we're completely accepting orders. Um, we don't we don't have any lead time uh, uh, other than the actual work that needs to be done. So. Rob, coming back to me again. Second, uh, can you comment on how confident you are about linking the right IDG subclass to the variable domains? I, uh, example given, uh, you may also assess some undigested sample, perhaps. Um, I suppose the right IDG subclass to the variable domains. Yeah, uh, we're, we're really quite confident, I suppose. Um, you know, we do... Uh, I can't say everything that we do, uh, but I would say that we're very confident in terms of assigning the right subclass. Yes, uh, we, we definitely do uh, differentiate between um, individual like, well, um, uh, IgGH, uh, IgG kappa, lambda, and then the individual uh, isotypes as well. Uh, you know, we have a, a strong ability, I, I would say, uh, to, to comment on uh, which uh, isotype it is that we're working with. Um, and I um, would be happy to kind of elaborate more on that uh, uh, 
on a private conversation with you, Rob. So I, I think I'll be reaching out to you afterwards as well so we can resolve that. Uh, Cheng Zhao, do you have a separate software to pair the light chain and the heavy chain for the PAB? Uh, nope. Uh, we just do that in-house. Like we, like I said, uh, have developed our own um, uh, software suite to do the uh, peptide sequencing, the assembly, um, and actually the the, the, chain, the chain pairing is, is more of an experimental approach than a software-based one. So uh, Xiaobing Han, with the development of maps from a PAB, how do you ensure the identity of the naturally paired heavy and light chains? Yeah, I think I did that already. Um, we kind of addressed that point already, um, but ultimately the, the best way to validate uh, the, the correct pairing is to actually express and test them. Maxime Gavage, if I understood you correctly, you separate, you separately sequence the light chain and heavy chain. Yep, that's correct. So how do you do the pairing? Uh, I think I've addressed that one already as well. Li Peng, uh, you mentioned that you use HDX to determine antigen epitope, uh, anti sorry, uh, to determine antigen epitope antibody interaction uh, amino acids. Can you determine a normal protein-protein interaction by HDX, a non-covalent interaction? Um, great question, uh, Lee. Uh, truthfully, I'm not experienced enough with the HDX uh, epitope mapping so uh, service to, to really answer your question. And so I'm gonna have to uh, mark that we answer this offline, but certainly we can follow up with you by email and um, speak with one of our scientists. Um, it's a newer service for us, so pardon, pardon my ignorance here. Alad Griffiths, have used this approach to characterize and compare different PABs raised from different immunogens against a specific target. Um, I suppose we have not. Um, we've typically um, taken these PABs um, raised from different immunogens against a specific target. Yeah, we typically just work with whatever people send us, um, which is um, you know in our experience a peptide. And so there's not usually a lot of different versions of a peptide uh, that we're working against a common target. Um, but sometimes people will send us different peptides against, I guess, against, I guess, um, like a, a protein target of interest, um, but we don't always do the purification work. So it's hard for me to comment further uh, on that point, but I'm um, certainly we're open to the idea um, of doing it that way as well. Bernard asking again, uh, how would you increase the production yield of recombinant PABs? Uh, great question. Um, I think, <laughs> I don't, I don't, actually, I don't think I'm a great person to be asking that question too, truthfully. Uh, I don't deal a lot with the expression side of things. Neither does our company. We have partners that work with us really um, to, to, to facilitate um, the expression. But I mean, you know, you, 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 could, you could choose Cho. Um, I would argue that the antibodies that we're finding are, are plasma blast derived. I don't have any proof for that claim, but since we're seeing them in very, very high abundance in the, in the, in the serum, um, I would argue that they're likely plasma blast derived and being produced in great quantities. So perhaps the sequence has something to do with it, but I mean, you probably know better than me, um, developability is you know, a, whole, a whole thing, um, which I don't really want to comment too much on at this point. Maxine, coming back, how many enzymes do you consider to obtain a sufficient uh, sequence coverage and overlapping uh, peptides? Uh, we use a handful, so five, six enzymes, um, but that's, you know, one part of the equation. Um, it, it's not like adding more enzymes is always going to get you um, more answers. So um, I think we've developed a number of different experimental protocols to ensure that we're getting high levels of coverage uh, when, we're, when we're reporting on these sequences. How much PAB do you, uh, Xiao John is asking, how much PAB material do you need for converting uh, PAB to MAB cocktail project. Uh, like I said, generally we ask for one uh, milligram of that antigen affinity purified IgG fraction. Um, but, you know, uh, let us know what kind of material you have, how much, what the circumstances are. Um, certainly sometimes we can lean on NGS sequencing a bit more uh, and use a little bit less material, particularly if it's possible to obtain heavy and light chain uh, paired um, NGS sequencing results. Um, you know, we use about a meg of material to do the project, but about half of it goes towards the chain pairing experiments that we run. And so sometimes uh, we can get away with less material if we have the heavy and light chains paired already. Rob coming back and asking, IgG subclass, constant domain in terms of polyclonals, says thank you. Great, that's it. That's all the questions. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that's all the questions, folks. I feel like we've answered this. How do you map peptides? Yep. Done, done, done. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, we can end it there. Thanks so much for joining everyone. And uh, yeah, you'll be receiving a email 
um, as a follow-up to this webinar. It'll include a recording of our conversation and um, certainly feel free to respond to that email and uh, we can always discuss